We're going to move into our first virtual tour. Uh, our first speaker in line is going to be Dr. Ted McCullum. Uh, Dr. McCullum is a professor and extension beef cattle specialist with Texas AgriLife Extension at the Amarillo uh, AgriLife Research and Extension Center. Uh, grew up on a ranch. He's been in that panhandle area for a long time, right, Ted? 16, 17 years. Uh, we always relate to Ted as he is our feed yard specialist. Uh, that's what he deals with because of where he is situated uh, in the state of Texas. He's got extensive background. He does a lot of work with the commercial feed yards out there, and we certainly appreciate him taking the time to visit with us and tell us and provide a little bit of a tour of a feed yard and give us some background on that. Dr. McCollum? How's everybody doing? Let me get my eyes adjusted to these spotlights up here. Uh, Jason wanted me to visit with you a little bit about feed yards. And in your uh, note or your proceedings, you should have a brief introduction to feed yards, kind of telling you about the state of Texas and our feed yards. What I thought I would run through is a few of those slides and we'll move into the video tour that uh, Dr. Hale put together. But the feed yard industry is a critical part of the Texas economy. Uh, if you Look at the multiplier effects of, of how the feed yards affect our economies. Uh, a lot of money flows through those feed yards. I think in your handout back in June, I put that the cost of gain was somewhere over $1.10. It's a lot over $1.10 right now. And uh, a lot of that money is flowing back into local economies, whether it's for truck drivers, cowboys, insurance companies, financial institutions, you name it. The money flows, back, all the value added to those feedlot cattle flows back into those local and regional economies and helps support those. And then we have other ancillary industries. You know, we would have no need for the packing industry in the state of Texas if we had no feed yards. And so they, they have a tremendous impact on our economies, providing employment and so forth. But <clears throat> just a few facts about Texas feed yards. Uh, Texas is the leading state in terms of cattle on feed and, and cattle marketed out of feed yards annually. This would be from uh, January the 1st of this year, national survey data for feed yards over 1,000 head capacity. And you will notice that Texas had the largest number of cattle on feed. If you look at marketings, Texas has the largest marketings in the United States for ca uh, feedlot cattle. The industry in the state of Texas is geographically distributed across the state from the tip of Texas on the Gulf Coast up through the top of the panhandle. The, uh, you can see the numbers from, again, the 2012 inventory. And we have, again, industry spread from South Texas through the Panhandle. The largest numbers of cattle, as you can see from those inventory numbers in the different regions, are up in the Panhandle region. But we have a very vibrant <coughs> industry in South Texas uh, feeding cattle from those areas and supported by the ag community in those areas. Feed yards in Texas, if we hit a number, average size of a feed yard in Texas is probably around 35,000 head of capacity, one time capacity. That capacity will turn one and a half to two and a half times a year, depending on the size of cattle that they're putting in the feed yards. Uh, range of size, we have feed yards that are less than 5,000 head, with feed, all the way up to feed yards that are over 80,000 head, one time capacity. This is some old information uh, back from 2008, but it's the most recent that I could find published, showing you a few of the demographics on the size of feed yards in the state. Uh, if you'll start over on the left-hand side of the graph, you can see feed yards with 1,000 to 3,999 head. At that time, there were 11 feed yards reported in the state, marketed about 20,000 head of cattle, or about 0.35% of the total marketings. And as you move across to the right, you can see that the majority of the marketings of fed cattle in the state of Texas are from feed yards with over 32,000 head capacity. About in 2008, about 75% of the marketings. You know, those numbers have probably changed a bit in the last four years, but this is still a real representation of the, of the demographics of the industry in the state. Back up just a moment. If we just to give you an idea, if, uh, in generality, as we move from the Panhandle region down to the Gulf Coast region, the size of the feed yards declines. Most of the feed yards up in the Panhandle High Plains area would be in excess of 16,000. Most of those feed yards in excess of 25,000 head of cattle. Uh, 
as we move towards South Texas, most of those feed yards would be under 20,000 head of cattle. There are some larger ones, but most of those would be under 20,000 head. As far as cattle ownership, people ask sometimes who owns the cattle, and this is a trend that's changing over the years and will continue to change in my opinion, uh, but cattle in these feed yards are owned by one of three groups or maybe all three. The first would be that the feed yard business itself owns cattle. And this isn't just some large company feed yard, this would be maybe some local Joe and Dan's feed yard that Joe and Dan, the feed yard owns part of those cattle or part of the cattle could be owned by the individuals that are partners or shareholders in the feed yard, or some of the cattle may be owned by individuals or business entities that are external to the ownership group, what we would call customers of the feed yard, or that's where the word custom cattle feeding comes from, that uh, a feed yard would essentially be the same as a hotel and restaurant business, and customers send their cattle into those feed yards to eat at the restaurant and sleep in, sleep in the beds and then pay the ownership. A trend that's occurring and has been occurring over time is that bottom group of cattle owners has declined and continues to decline. And so even if, if it is a small, if you want to call it privately held feed yard that may have two or three or four individuals that own that feed yard, not some corporate entity or large corporate entity that you might think of, by and large, a lot of those cattle in those feed yards belong to the three or four guys that may own the feed yard because the customer base has begun to slip. Uh, part of that is due to the risk involved in the cattle feeding uh, <clears throat> or other reasons. This year may be, a re may be a year that we see some pickup in the business of customers because of the conditions with the drought and so forth that are forcing cattle uh, into feed yards. Also, some of the yearlings that have been out on pasture this summer, what looked like was going to be a big cash to check this fall, or big check to cash this fall because the marketing conditions have deteriorated, it may stimulate some folks to go ahead and own those cattle for a period longer to see if they can recoup some of that uh, value. But that would be who owns the cattle. Another good point about the feed yards is uh, estimate is that over 85% of the feed yard capacity in the state of Texas is under the Texas Cattle Feeders Association Beef Quality Assurance Program. You heard Jason Banna talk a bit about the Texas Beef Quality Producer Program. That's the BQA program for cow, calf, and stalker in the state. This is the feed yard BQA program. Once again, about 85% or a bit more of the capacity in the state is covered under that program. The focus of this program is on food safety, beef quality, and cattle handling and well-being. They have established BMPs. Each feed yard is required to develop best management practices addressing the focus areas of the Beef Quality Assurance Program. They're required to keep records. They're, they're required to have annual employee training pertinent to that employee's duties and responsibilities in the feed yard. And they're required to undergo an annual third party audit uh, each year. And uh, if they fail to meet, some, meet the criteria, then they will <coughs> be put on probation, if you want to call it that, until they can correct those criteria and be recertified in the program. Uh, all of the feed yards are under professional management. Uh, all the employees are well trained, either trained by the management that's in place or trained by the nutritional and, and veterinary consultants that work for the feed yard. Uh, the yards have seasoned top level and mid-level management. Uh, you're not going to find some young buck out of college three months managing a feed yard. The, there are people that have been there for a while and know the business. Each of these will have re re consultants on retainer that deal with their veterinary medicine programs, both their preventative programs and their therapy programs for the cattle. They have professional nutritionists that are developing their nutritional programs and are supervising their nutritional programs. And they also work with environmental monitoring groups, uh, engineers and others to ensure that they are meeting the regulations set forth by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So it kind of gives a run through on the feed yards. Let's uh, walk through a video now, <laughs> if I could have the video please, uh, to look at uh, some of my work on feed yards. Again, the original, where do cattle come from? If we go back to the cattle on feed numbers and marketings in the state of Texas, again, we'll market somewhere between six and seven million head of cattle from feed yards in the state of Texas each year. Uh, 
If you've checked the cow inventory lately in the state of Texas, we have somewhere less than about 5 million head of cattle, give or take, depending on how many have disappeared in the last couple of years. So we bring a significant number of cattle in from other locations in the country. We have to, to, to fill that feed yard capacity. They're coming from cow-calf operations. I would say by and large our calves are, are originating somewhere in the southeastern United States. Uh, we may start in New Mexico and move east. Most of the northern cattle stay up north, don't move down into this area. We have varied genetics that will come into the feed yards. They may be like the previous calves you saw that are Brahmin cross cattle, or they may be cattle such as these that uh, have more British and continental influence in the cattle. But a wide array coming from different locations <coughs> in the country. Placement weights, the cattle, if we have what we call true feeder cattle, will come in weighing six to 800 pounds most of the time. We have had calves coming into the feed yards in the last year or so due to uh, conditions as well as some prices where it, it's priced to buy those light calves and manage over a long period of time. The cattle be transported in. That truck, that truck ride may be anywhere from less than one hour to over 24 hours, depending on what part of the country they're coming from. Uh, they move in. Uh, as they come into the yard, that the length of that truck ride is important where we evaluate risk on the cattle as they come into the feed yard to help determine what our processing programs are and what uh, challenges may be faced. Now we're going to start uh, moving into a feed yard <coughs> tour. This is a feed yard up by Amarillo. Stop the video for a minute. This feed yard's about an 80,000 head capacity feed yard. One time capacity, 80,000 head. You can see part of the footprint on the yard find a pointer here, excuse me. The footprint on the yard, <coughs> you can see up in this area would be a processing and hospital area. We can, you can see an unloading facility. This happens to be uh, one of two of each of those. There's another set of facilities over here on the yard. Again, this is an 80,000 head yard, so the, these pens would be 100 to 200 head capacity pens. So you can do the math on how many pens you can actually see. This large area would be the holding ponds. Feed yards are required to have holding pond facilities to contain uh, run, runoff coming off of the pens. <clears throat> so they have large holding pond facilities. Uh, these are typically not pumped out in our area at least. That We typically, as dry as we are, can uh, depend on evaporation to reduce the loads in those pond, or those holding ponds. Uh, as we move on down to this side of the feed yard, As it moves down, then we can see the uh, then we see the office buildings. Here's the feed mill, the hub of the feed yard, if you wanted to put it that way. This is where the most of the activity originates in the feed yard, then it spreads out across the feed yard. As we focus down, you can see a little bit more of the footprint. One of the things I'd like to point out as we look at this point is uh, look at this, this would be a pen. Here's the division between the pens and another pen laying up here. If you drive through a feed yard by the highway and you look at the cattle in that pen, they look like they're crowded in that pen, just based on what you can see from the ground level. But if you look at this from the air, you can see that those cattle aren't as crowded as they might appear to be. Out in our area, we typically are going to allow somewhere around 150 to 175 square feet per animal in that pen with eight to 10 inches of bunk space per head uh, for them to <coughs> consume feed from. That changes based on the season of the year. <coughs> As we move around and then begin looking at the feed yard, here would be the feed mill. Here's a set of calves that uh, have evidently just been in for a short period of time. Typically when calves arrive and they're unloaded off the truck, depending on the time of day, length of the haul, season of the year, temp prevailing temperatures and so forth, the cattle are typically uh, unloaded, allowed to rest for 12 to maybe 36 hours, depending on what the evaluation is. At that time, they're, or they're put into a pen during that time they're resting where they can rehydrate. They have long stem grass hay available to them so they can go ahead and fill up on feed. And then they will be, after that period of time, they will move back, moved in for processing to prepare them for the rest of the feeding period. 
here's Dr. Bob Smith, who's a consulting veterinarian, uh, going through and evaluating some feeder calves. They'll evaluate those calves, look for potential problems that they might encounter. Each feed yard has a group of people such as these. You may call them cowboys, you may call them pen riders. These are the eyes of the feed yard. These fellows are on the yard, out in the pens daily, checking cattle, <coughs> looking for issues that the cattle might be facing, locating the cattle that are sick, moving those into hospital areas, preparing cattle to be shipped to harvest. These are the guys that are out in, again, the eyes of the feed yard and actually doing a lot of the work in handling the cattle. This group's uh, apparently receiving directions from the cattle manager, the fellow back there walking the alley. Uh, the cattle that we saw, those that came in and were in the pens, uh, for about the first three weeks after cattle are in, these guys will be in the pen two, maybe two times a day checking for sick cattle. Once the cattle are straightened out and on their feet, they'll be back in the pens about once a day uh, checking for cattle that have problems, moving them out if they need to. This would be a set of steers. Uh, this feed yard where this picture was taken is uh, the, all the cattle that come into this feed yard have been backgrounded already, so they're not a lot of fresh cattle. So the main issue that these guys have on the pen riders is finding the ones that uh, may have had some latent problems or cattle that uh, are potentially having some digestive disturbances. This again would be a pen rider. Looks like they're sorting cattle in this picture or moving for harvest, <coughs> potentially, or moving to reimplant. Uh, these are some cattle in a sick pen. Uh, notice a couple of things as cattle come in or pulled by the pen riders for health issues, they will be moved into a hospital area and they'll stay in that hospital area until they've recovered well enough to go back into their home pen. A couple of things to notice here, uh, the, the tag in the left ear of these cattle would be what we call the lot tag. That's the general identification tag telling you what pen and who the, who the cattle belong to. Notice that the blue tag over in this other ear, each one of those are individual numbers. That's a tracking system. These cattle have come into the hospital. They've received, received some type of treatment. They now have an individual number in their ear so that they can be tracked on computer as to as far as what treatments they've been on and how many days they need to follow through on withdrawals or also what treatments they've been on and if they need to progress to a different set of treatments if the cattle aren't recovering well. These are relatively light calves in this picture. <coughs> uh, typical uh, if you haven't seen a sick calf before that's having some health problems, these would be a typical picture of what they might look like. <clears throat> Again, they'll be gant, off feed. You can see having some respiration difficulties. <clears throat> and uh, they will stay in the hospital until they are fully recovered or recovered enough to go back into their main group and continue the feeding period. Uh, here's a steer with a bit more advanced health problems. This would be just another shot of a hospital pen. <clears throat> and focusing in on a calf that you can see has some respiration difficulties. Respiratory disease or pneumonia is the main health issue on these calves their first two to four weeks in at the feed yards. Uh, beyond that period of time, occasionally you'll have some respiratory problems, but beyond that period of time, you're typically dealing with other issues such as digestive upset. Just some more footage of processing some cattle. Once again, all of these processing protocols, what vaccinations, what parasite treatments, uh, if the cattle are ill and they have to be treated for disease, the regimens for treating those cattle for, with pharmaceuticals and antibiotics, those are all set out by the consulting veterinarian uh, for the feed yard and those protocols are followed by the employees that work at the feed yard. After the cattle are straightened out, it usually takes about probably three weeks, four, to really get the cattle on their feet during that three or four week period of time. The cattle will have moved up through a progression of rations, moving from that grass hay that we saw in that picture a few minutes ago up through a series of steps where this, at each one of those steps, the amount of grain in the ration is increased. This allows the microbial population in the rumen of the cattle to adapt, shift, and move to a, a microbial population that's adapted to utilizing the grain or the high concentrate type diet. Once they've moved through that progression, then hopefully it's smooth sailing for the next 120 to 180 days that those cattle are on feed. The challenge is to maintain feed intake, timely feed deliveries, and have the cattle gain weight efficiently and move towards harvest. You can see these various cattle here. 
I believe Dr. Hale's on the back of the pickup and the feed truck had been by. And so you can see quite a few of them lined up ready to go. The cattle will be fed two to three times a day. So their, their total daily feed, feed allotment will be divided into two or three feedings during that time period. You may ask why do they feed two or three times a day? One of the reasons is to <clears throat> be able to spread labor and spread equipment over more time. If you had to feed 80,000 head of cattle, in this case, one time a day, uh, you would be, your trucks would be having difficulties and you couldn't cover the entire feed yard. By feeding twice to three times a day, you can cover the feed yard more completely in a shorter period of time. And just another set of cattle. Uh, you can see some of these are relatively uniform in hide color and size, and there's other, other pens that you'll see that are a little bit more varied. <clears throat> this is a feed mill. This is a feed mills at the feed yards vary in complexity. This would be what I might call an older feed mill. And uh, if we look at this feed mill, basically we move from uh, over here would be storage and soak tanks for the grain. And as you move from this area of the feed mill to this area of the feed mill, we're moving from raw commodities to grain processing to mixing feed that's put into the trucks to move to the cattle. The feed yards out in our area, and I think a lot of them in South Texas, all of them are going to process grain in some fashion. The primary grain processing used is steam flaking. We'll see that in just a moment. You can see the steam coming out of the side of this building. This is where the steam apparatus are, where they are steaming the grain and flaking the grain. On these, if you figure that the average feed intake per day on a ration, and it varies on moisture content, but let's call it about 25 pounds of feed per day per head. So for every 10,000 head of cattle, there's 25,000 head, or excuse me, 250,000 pounds of feed being manufactured each day at this feed yard. The feed yards buy raw commodities, they buy raw grains, byproduct feeds, roughages, and they manufacture the feed for the, uh, for the cattle. You can see the steam, various steam apparatus. <clears throat> this would be some wet distillers grains. If you've never seen wet distillers grains out in the High Plains area at least, our average number is about 20% of the dry matter consumed each day by feedlot cattle is coming out of our dis uh, ethanol plants. Here's roughage byproducts. This would be some concentrated, uh, looks like mineral type supplement. This would be whole cotton seed that's used in some of the feed yards. Here's an energy and roughage base. This would be dried distillers grains that would be coming in out of the Midwest on rail. It would be used as a protein and an energy source in the ration. Uh, this appears to be corn gluten feed pellets, which again are coming out of the Midwest out of the wet milling of corn. Uh, this would be another, looks like concentrated mineral type uh, feed that would go into a mineral. Again, long stemmed hay or silage form the roughage component of the rations. <clears throat> Uh, the rations will typically have about 8 to 10 percent roughage on a dry matter basis in those feeds with the roughage primarily being used to maintain gut health and maintain feed intake on the calves. <clears throat> this front end loader, this pay loader, uh, the majority of the feeds being mixed back up in this portion of the feed mill, what this pay loader is doing, these are called roughage boxes, but they will move the, dry, the wet distiller's grains and any chopped hay or roughage that's outside the feed yard, that will be loaded into these roughage boxes and you'll see a, in just a moment, after that's loaded into that roughage box, you can see conveyor belts right here on the bottom of that roughage box and that, uh, this conveyor belt, so that material that was loaded into that box is then conveyed up into the feed mill to be mixed with the other feed ingredients. Uh, what we just scanned down across here, this is called a steam chest that is full of corn. The, as I said, most of the feed yards or all the feed yards up in my region of the state use steam flaking. That's where we, <coughs> you soak corn in water, expose it to steam, and then run it through roller mills to flake the corn. And we'll see pictures of it in just a minute. <coughs> This is dropping down. This is what would be called a peg feeder. So it regulates the, the speed at which the corn falls out of the steam chest down into the rolls that we'll see in just a moment. <clears throat> so you can see this is raw corn that's been steamed that's now falling into the roller mill. <clears throat> 
You can see it's, that's maintained at about 210 to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you can see these would be the actual rolls. So the corn is falling through the peg feeder. These would be the rolls where the corn is falling through the rolls and then being flaked. And this grain is flaked. There's a picture that would be flaked corn. <clears throat> Looks kind of like what you'd pour out of your Kellogg's box, not quite that pretty. But uh, we flake corn to increase the energy density. Our, our grain in Texas costs a lot more than grain in Nebraska does. We have to ship it from Nebraska or Iowa, and so we flake the grain or process the grain to enhance the energy value and, and obtain more value from that grain as we feed it to the cattle. They will take corn, in this case, we'll take it from a, what would be a standard 56-pound bushel of corn uh, down to about a 26 to 28-pound bushel weight on the flake corn. And basically what we're doing here is we're gelatinizing the starch and making it more fermentable by the bacteria in the rumen and enhancing the energy value. That same process would be used with sorghum if we were looking at sorghum, but corn's the primary feed grain used across the state of Texas. There are yards using uh, sorghum, but uh, they're by far in the minority. This would be an area that's uh, in the feed yard that's called the micro-ingredient room. Uh, you can see these are bags of concentrated feed additives. This would be Thailand, which is an antibiotic used to prevent or reduce liver abscesses in cattle. Uh, you can see some Bovatec right here, which would be used in starter rations for calves. Here's some Rumensin that would be <coughs> concentrated and used in the finishing rations. And then this would uh, appear to possibly be some Optiflex, which is another feed additive that would be used. This is, but in this micro-ingredient room, they have computerized instruments that weigh out these ingredients in small, <coughs> concise or precise amounts, then mix those with water. That's then conveyed and put into the finished feed to deliver those feed additives to the cattle. So that's, those will be feed additives. Well, as we pan across here in just a moment, you'll also see vitamins are added in this manner. Here's another mineral additive that goes in, and then you can see this slurry of material where that's all put into a water slurry, and then that's put into the main mixer to deliver those feed additives, vitamins, and minerals to the cattle. This would be a feed truck moving in to load up with feed. <clears throat> Once again, these trucks will run for each pen. Each pen will receive a delivery two to three times a day. This is the main control in the feed mill. Uh, the, the feed mill manager here, this employee, is uh, dumping feed out of what are called the finished feed bins. It's finished feed ready to go, dumping that into the truck, which will then deliver that feed to the cattle. The inside of these feed mills, these uh, big feed mills, highly computerized, you could go dizzy looking at a lot of the gauges in these feed mills. These are the control panels. Once again, uh, telling you where, what's in various bins, <coughs> both from a commodity standpoint, but also finished feed in those bins. This is switching to a different feed yards control panel. These are actually scales on the various bins, and you can, you'll be able to see where it's beginning to add feed as they mix feed in those <coughs> different bins. You can see the pounds increasing as it's adding those commodities into those uh, batches to produce the finished feed. And as we stop here, it's a bit blurry, but you can start seeing that it's showing where it's delivering grain, silage, and distiller's grains in to make this ration. And again, it's all computerized and tracked through that main feed mill terminal. <clears throat> Part of what I want you to get through here is this business is very professional, uses a lot of technology. It's not like my brother and I at the growing yard we own out there with a front end loader and a mixer truck just mixing stuff on the back of the truck. It's, it's very technical, uh, highly monitored. Again, here's finished feed falling out of the finished feed bin into the truck so that they can be delivered out to the pens. <coughs> Inside these trucks, if we can get a look here, each one of these trucks in this case has a computer mounted inside that truck and that, commu that computer is in communication with the main terminal. Uh, that 
main terminal has the feed orders for the day for each one of those pins. As the feed truck driver loads that ration onto that truck, the computer's going to tell him which pins to deliver that feed to and how many pounds to put in each pin. And then that's relayed back to the main terminal computer to record that information for the day. <clears throat> the guys sitting behind that wheel right there are very important. Uh, they are the ones that, may, that uh, have a key role in ensuring that the proper amount of feed is delivered to maintain performance and also avoid health problems or digestive upsets in the cattle. <clears throat> Move out to the pins. Again, uh, the feed will put out, as I said, two to three times a day. If you watch, uh, he'll pull up here and stop. The, then uh, if you can see him up in the cab, he's playing with the computer to record what was delivered to that pen. He'll pull up to the next bunk, uh, set the spout down, reach up to the computer, key in the, com the pen number for that uh, <coughs> pen of cattle. It'll bring up the pounds of feed that should be delivered into the bunk. Then they move, progress down, deliver feed. Uh, as you can see from this one, uh, he could not deliver the feed in one run, so now he's backing it up to finish the, the run on the feed. So again, that, that process continues depending on the weight of the cattle when they came in. Cattle will typically on, be on feed shortest period of time, probably about 120 days. Longest period of time, somewhere in excess of 300 pounds for very light cattle that have come into the feed yards and remain there for the entire period of time. Uh, Again, they're monitored daily by pen riders. The feed calls, the amount of feed that's put in that bunk every day. There's a man at, uh, that works at the feed yard that's called a feed caller or bunk reader. He travels those pens once to three times a day, making his feed calls and adjusting the feed intake on the cattle to ensure that feed consumption is max that it could be to have the most efficient performance, but also to guard against any digestive upsets that might result from bad calls. Then after the end of that finish, end of that period, the cattle will be moved to harvest. Dr. Hale will visit with you about that in just a moment. A couple of key aspects I mentioned earlier. Uh, any facility that has over a thousand head in that facility for an extended period of time is considered a CAFO, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation by the Environmental Protection Agency in the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So there are regulations that they must follow in terms of management of waste nutrients, both liquid, which would be runoff, as well as solid waste from the feed yard. Uh, they have to keep records on the amount that's produced. They have to keep records on how they store it. They must keep records on how they distribute that if they're putting it out on cropland and then file annual reports with those agencies <coughs> on their management procedures. Uh, this would be a, uh, just an individual cleaning a pen. One thing that, uh, depending on the time of the year, that mound may stay in the pen. Many times pens are mounded to give the cattle a dry place to uh, rest in the winter months when we may have wet weather. This would be an example of where manure is being composted on the feed yard. This would be holding ponds. Once again, the feed yards have to have enough holding ponds to capture <coughs> Uh, large rainfall events and prevent any discharge from the feed yard facility. Uh, some feed yards have, uh, in this case, uh, what this fellow is doing is adjusting for sprinklers in the pens. And sprinklers can serve two purposes. The primary purpose would be to help with dust abatement. When it becomes dry and especially when it's warm outside, late in the evening, potentially early in the morning, we have what are called dust events. It's been hot all day, the cattle have been laying around, it starts to cool off in the evening, the cattle become active, and there's a lot of dust because of the cattle moving around, and we will use the, these sprinklers as a way to try helping with dust abatement in the feed yard to cut down on the amount of dust that's produced. In some cases, they can be used also for heat, uh, to avoid some heat stress on cattle, to again, wet the cattle down, uh, and potentially let them uh, release heat by convection.
but by and large out in the area, these are used for dust abatement procedures in the feed yards. And that's the end of the tour. Dan or Jason, I appreciate your time.